Hello, good evening, and welcome everyone to another In Conversation with the Vet. Fifty years ago this week, I met a young Scottish economist from Cambridge, England, who was unknown to the profession at all, but obviously brilliant. Later, he emigrated to teach at Princeton. Four years ago, he was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his work on linking individual choices with aggregate outcomes, which, in the words of the Nobel Committee, transformed microeconomics, macroeconomics, and development economics. Quite an achievement. But unlike some Nobel laureates, and one, a scientist, we won't mention any names, who explained that he'd given up research having won the Nobel Prize because he wanted to pursue, and I quote, fast women and beautiful cars, <laughs> end quote. My friend carried on working, and not long ago, with Anne Case, his wife, they discovered the so-called deaths of despair, rising mortality in parts of the American community. So it's with very great pleasure that I welcome my old friend and someone who is now not unknown, but known to presidents and prime ministers around the world. Please give a very warm, stern welcome to Professor Sir Angus Deaton. Angus, thank you for coming to, to Stern and talking with us and later on asking, answering some questions from students. I bet 50 years ago you never imagined that the two of us would finish up on a stage in New York. <laughs> I don't know what I thought we'd do. The um, Beatles of economics. You know, well, I, I actually rather thought that... Um, I was rather jealous of folks like you who'd been sort of properly educated in economics. Um, because I'd, I was sort of a failed mathematician who fell into economics. Um, and I never really, you know, I came to Cambridge because my girlfriend was there. So, you know, I was pursuing the beautiful women in fast cars <laughs> early even in then, life. Even then, even then. Late in life. And I really thought it was just, you know, we were essentially research assistants yes. at that point, right? Yep. And I just thought of it as a sort of temporary job for the mm -hmm. time being. It never really occurred to me that we'd go on doing these things. Well, it certainly led to something. Now, I, I mentioned the, the work that you did with Anne Case, who is with us here tonight. And, and you and Anne discovered this phenomenon of rising mortality, which is partly the opioid epidemic, but not exclusively so. It includes alcohol-related diseases and, and suicides. But how did you discover this? Well, really, like most of the best things I've discovered, um, by a total accident, um, you know, we were looking for something else. And then you fall across something. And um, I think that's a very important lesson for research, actually. That, um, and I, I don't know who said it. Um, but, you know, when you see something strange like that, the skill comes in, even if you're not looking for it, you know what you're looking at in some sense, you know, so that it, it's, you know, otherwise you might just pass it by. And right. so, so I'll tell you what happened. Um, I'd agreed to write a paper for a National Bureau of Economic Research Conference on suicide and happiness, which may seem odd topics together. Indeed. But for many years, I'd read some of the happiness literature, um, and I, it occurred to me that, you know, there were high suicide rates in some Scandinavia. This was just casual, uh -huh. um, sort of what I'd read. So I wrote to two of the great experts in happiness economics, who were um, Danny Blanchflower and um, Andrew Oswald. Right? I wrote to each of them separately and said, you know, is suicide correlated with happiness or is it the reverse? And they both wrote to me back with complete and utter certainty, but gave completely different answers. Right? <laughs> One said it's negatively correlated, the other said it was positively correlated. So I'd said it would be a good thing for this conference to look at the relationship between happiness and suicide. And we were pretty far along in that, but I was thought, 
it would be good for this conference. Oh, one of the things we discovered was that in midlife, you know, in sort of 45 to 55 age range, suicides have been rising quite rapidly in the US. And this is still true, and it's very much in contrast with what's happening anywhere else in the world, where suicide rates are typically falling um, quite rapidly. Um, so that was interesting. Um, but we thought it would be good to have a slide in which we put this increase in suicides together with what was happening to all deaths together. You know, because was this a small part? You know, was it swamped by other things? What, what were you going to see? And then that was when we saw this thing we couldn't believe, which was that all deaths were going up. You know, so total mortality in this age group around 50 um, was actually rising. And that's just, you know, something that should not happen. Yeah. You know, in midlife, as in other parts in life, mortality rates have been falling for 100 years, maybe longer than 100, 150 years or so. And um, we thought, you know, we've got to have done something wrong. And if we haven't done something, if it's true, then someone else must know this. Um, and so, you know, we then went into this um, search, you know, had we pressed the wrong button, you know, had we really used the data wrongly and so on, and then just did this enormous amount of search trying to find out whether this was right or not. And it was right. I mean, you know, maybe we overstated it a bit, or, but it's right, and it's still there. And, you know, you've got these curves which have been going down like this for a very long time, and then all of a sudden they stop, and they're either flat or rising. And, you know, <laughs> We submitted this to one of the leading medical journals, and I thought I'd sent it to the wrong email address because it came up immediately. And I thought, oh, I got the email address wrong. But I looked at it and said, your paper has been rejected. This is of no interest. The Journal of the Medi American Medical Association. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, <laughs> the editor of JAMA that's become sort of a friend has been bought us a very, very expensive lunch one day. So, you know. <laughs> Trying to, but you know they get, they get the number of submissions that would make an economics journal look puny, you know, and so they have layers, and presumably one of these layers didn't work very well. But then we sent it to New England Journal of Medicine, and that's sort of interesting too, because that took a little longer, like four days, to be rejected, right? And uh, they're faster than we are. <laughs> Certainly <laughs> which are. Is a good thing. So actually, I wrote to the woman had written to us, and I said, um, you know, we're a little puzzled by this. And she said, you're clearly fascinated with this increase in deaths, but you do not have a cause, and therefore it's of no interest to us. And this is what I think is the causal fetish that has taken over our profession. You know, it's just absolutely ridiculous. It's sort of like you call the fire brigade and say, my house is burning down. And they say, well, what caused the fire? Oh, yeah. And you say, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's burning. Come. And they say, no, we can't come until you tell us what the cause is, you know, <laughs> and then hang up on you. So, you know, we, we um, eventually thought, well, we could publish it in the National Bureau of Working Paper, but we actually wanted to reach a wider audience than you get mm -hmm. in just that. So, you know, I'm a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, which has the, it allows you basically self-publish in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. There are a lot of hoops you have to jump through, and it's actually quite a good process, I think. Well, I would, wouldn't I? Um, and so it came out, and then there was just a huge firestorm. Um, what what prompted now. that explosion of interest? To me? Well, it was in an election year, <laughs> okay. um, and essentially every presidential candidate of both parties talked, Studies, about, yeah. talked about the work. And of course, you know, Trump's American carnage yeah. is, is sort of part of that. But then other people, of course, put their own spin on it, and everybody had a different um, story about it. And then it was from then on that we saw, well, if this is going up, what's driving this? We knew suicide was part of it. Um, and then we looked for the other things that were very rapidly growing, and the two other things that were rapidly growing were alcoholic liver disease and um, opioids, or at least drug overdoses. And the drug overdoses are the biggest of the three, but the, and, you know, we didn't discover the opioid crisis. I mean, lots of people knew about that before, um, but it didn't have the attention then that they it has that, yeah. even five years later. Um, so politicians have been talking about this, but they don't really seem to have an understanding of why this has happened, why the deaths of despair have suddenly 
appeared and reversed the downward trend in mortality. You've thought a lot about this. Yes. What, what, what's your view as to why this is happening and what would be the right directions in which to try to change it? Okay, well, the answers are in our book. Ah, but this book isn't available yet. It'll be available on the 17th of March, St. Yeah. Patrick's Day. Yeah. You must give everyone the title, because this title guarantees it'll be a bestseller. It's called Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism. Boy, yeah. is that a pretentious title. But, it's you know. a great title. I would advise everyone to rush home tonight and pre-order it. You can pre-order it. The, the, the pre-ordered copies are flying off the shelves. They're flying off the shelves, yeah. <laughs> You can't even see the cover yet because it's very early days and we're copy editing the manuscript. But, you know, <clears throat> there are various levels of that story as to what's going on and there's no agreement, right? So one part of it that's not very controversial is the opioid epidemic. Uh -huh. And there's been huge misbehavior by pharmaceutical companies that have been pushing this out. And also the FDA in approving this stuff. Uh -huh. I mean, they basically legalized heroin Right, and it never seemed to occur to them that this stuff would get diverted. Right. Okay, so they assumed it would be used only in specific medically controlled circumstances. That's right, and you know, it's it's very interesting that you know the FDA requires people to do randomized controlled trials. They did randomized controlled trials. They're not very impressive randomized controlled trials, but there's a lot of pressure. Um, but they they're not allowed to actually consider the effects on other people of approving a drug, right? They're not allowed to. No, I mean, we're NICE in Britain. NICE is the National Institute of Clinical Education, excellent, excellent which evaluates drugs. <laughs> and the very first drug they turned down, which is something now turned into Tamiflu, and they turn it down because people going to doctor's office with the flu to get drugs would spread the flu to other people in the doctor's office, right? And so they disproved it on, that, on those grounds, not because it didn't work, but because it would make things worse in the aggregate. Right. Right? The FDA never considered that and is not allowed to consider that, oh. even though there's now a National Academy panel recommending that they do that. But you know, for those of you who are interested in randomized controlled trials, this is what they call the SUTVA assumption. The, um, I don't know what that stands for, but it's S-U-T-V-A. And it's the, it means it basically rules out interactions between people. Uh -huh. You know, which if you're taking an aspirin, I take an aspirin, it probably doesn't do much to you. But if you start allowing doctors with pharma companies, you know, pushing them to get rid of this stuff like crazy, um, and it's heroin, which is basically what it is. And also here is, it turns out J&J, &J, this big family-friendly company, is growing opium poppies in Tasmania at the same, which are supplying almost all of the opioids in the United States, at the same time as the U.S. is bombing Afghanistan and Colombia and places to try and keep drugs out. That's extraordinary. I had no idea. Well, it's very important that people say these things Absolutely. because these guys are completely out of control. So, you know, but opioids is not every, I mean, some people would say it's just a drug epidemic. But right. then why are right. suicides rising in right. America and not anywhere else? And then what we discovered fairly early on, but it's really, really a big deal, is this only happening to people who don't have a BA, a four-year BA. So if you split people along this thing between people who have a four-year BA and people who don't have a four-year BA, there's almost no change for people who have a college degree. Right? And then for people who don't have a four-year BA, all the bad stuff is happening. Now, and some, you know, we took this to the suicide division of NIH in whichever part of Maryland. And the director there said he'd never seen or ever expected to see anything like this, which is ever since Durkheim, and actually before yeah. Durkheim, yeah. they said it was more educated people that killed themselves. Right. And for people like you and me who came from very modest backgrounds, the gulf that existed, you know, when you moved to Cambridge from oh, Wolverhampton yeah. or from yeah. Scotland or something, yeah. you know, this huge moat that was driven between you and your parents' life sort of idea, then you could see why people would become unmoored and why it would be a risk of suicide. And that's what Durkheim said. And now it's reversed, probably for the first time in history, that less educated people are more likely to kill themselves than more educated people. So something has really gone wrong in working class lives. Now, then the disagreement sort of starts.
And you know, if you go to the right, you talk to Charles Murray, he'll say it's because people have lost the virtue and they're doing this to themselves. For us, the labor market is really turned against working class people. And you know, there's automation and globalization in the background, but you know, there's automation and globalization all over Europe and people aren't killing themselves in droves. So it's beginning to happen in England. Yes, it is. And in Scotland, where I come from, yeah. it's really bad. Um, so there's a real risk there. And a lot of what we write about in the book is the extent to which what's happening in the US is a foretaste of what's going to happen in Europe, or whether it's to do with American exceptionalism. Tell us what you think ought to be on the agenda of the presidential candidate. Medicare for all. Medica medical care for all. Yeah. I mean, how, how would this affect suicide rates and. Because what's happening is we're spending 18% of GDP on health care, and it's nothing to do with health care preventing deaths directly. Mm -hmm. It's that health care, I think Warren Buffett called it a tapeworm in the economy. We call it a cancer at the center of the economy that is metastized. Now, I'm not in favor of socialized medicine particularly. I, I don't, there'll be all sorts of problems with Medicare for all, but you could bring costs under control yeah. and stop, you know, if, if, if you got the 18% of GDP down to 12%, which is what, Canada, what Switzerland spent, and Switzerland's the second highest, that would save $8,000 a year for every family in the United States. Right? If you take people without a BA, their real wages have fallen for, um, no one told me to turn my phone off, you see, I'm doing that now. No. The real I'm, wages I'm being not used to the idea of these modern contraptions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the real wages have been falling since 19, falling, not just stagnant, yeah, right. have been falling since 1970. You give them that $8,500 back and it's not happening anymore. So, you know, and this is men who don't have good wages are not good managed partners. Um, the marriage behavior of whites without a BA looks like um, African Americans in the 60s and 70s, you know, and the Moynihan Report and all that yeah. stuff about that, and what William Julius Wilson has written about. Most white moms without a BA have their children out of wedlock. I mean, it's just astonishing. Yeah. They don't go to church anymore, uh -huh. which in America is, is really a big thing. I know in Britain none of us go to church, but here people go to church and they stop. And the fall is much larger for people without a BA. Social capital has fallen. You know, if you talk to Bob Putnam, that's the sort of center of the thing. So it's, it's like their marriages, um, labor force participation has fallen. Um, it's been falling for men without a BA for a very long time. And since 2000, it's been falling for women without a BA too. Um, and you know, this labor force participation is going down at a time when wages are falling. So for those of us who did the supply and demand curve yeah. in Econ 101, that suggests it's not that people are withdrawing their labor from the labor force. It's just that these jobs are turning into bad jobs and companies are outsourcing jobs and so on. And part of the reason that companies are shedding you know, low-skilled workers is not just because of globalization automation. It's because they might have to spend 30 or 40 percent of their salaries on health care and other things. So it's just this enormous burden. And because it's diffused, people don't really understand the extent to which this cancer is spreading yeah. everywhere. Um, local governments are cutting back on, f not local governments, state government, cutting back on funding state education and universities because Medicaid is putting them out of business. And one of the reasons, apart from all the other dysfunctions in Washington, that we never had infrastructure repairs is because the deficit is being pressed by all this Medicare and Medicaid all the time. So if we don't get this under control, there's going to be nothing left. Now, in your Nobel lecture, you, you talked about a theme which, brings your, which unites your research. And it seems to me very close to what you've just been discussing. In that lecture, you used the phrase well-being. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by well-being and, and how has it linked your research together? Well, you know, we used to call it welfare when we were young, but <laughs> welfare has come to mean something else. Indeed. Right? So, there was a branch of economics called welfare economics. Yes, and it, it died, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't exist anymore. <clears throat> and we read some wonderful stuff. Yeah, you remember absolutely. Jan de Villiers' graph, you know, fabulous. Um, yeah. 
South African economist who came to do a PhD at Cambridge and wrote this fabulous book called Theoretical Welfare Economics, a little thin book, and it's just a truly wonderful book. Of course, they tried to fail his PhD at Cambridge because you're not supposed to do things like that. <laughs> he then uh, went back to run a farm in South Africa. Yeah. Well, it wasn't exactly a farm. It's in Constantia, which is, you know, the oldest and most beautiful yeah. part of South Africa. And I once met him and he said, well, if you, you, you if you, I said we were going to be in South Africa, and he said, well, you should go there. I said, oh, great, we'll come and visit. He said, well, we won't be there, but I'll ask the servants to open the house for you. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, so there was this welfare economics, and well-being is now the subject that you know, it covers happiness, it covers a lot of different um, ways. But, you know, I do think of it as going back to where we started, which is right. thinking about consumer behavior and savings and utility functions and all that sort of stuff that you used to learn in microeconomics yeah. and which we tried to bring to the data. I mean, you were sort of doing it for firms and I was doing it for household. So, to go back to what you were, the work you'd done on this extraordinarily topical issue of deaths of despair. More generally, what, what do you see as the role of the social scientist in public policy? <laughs> I, I've been thinking about that, worrying about that. Um, you know, I, I just read um, Benjamin Applebaum's book uh -huh. called The Economist's Hour, which basically condemns economics for what it's done for the last 50 years. And, you know, he wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times which summarized it, which I thought was awful. <coughs> because I thought, you know, it was all, it's like all economists are like Milton Friedman, you know, which is just not true. But the book is much, much better than that. And actually does build a case to be answered. And, I mean, the question is, has economics really contributed much to the um, public well-being? Um, over the last half century. And I think, yes, in some things, but I think it has a lot of sins to be accounted for, too. So I, I think, you know, I thought we were sort of ivory tower people and we'd sit and think about things and then that stuff would leak out. I think central banking is something that's much better than it was 50 years ago, right? You don't have inflation rates around the world. Bill Easterly sitting over there has just written a very nice paper showing that, you know, in most of the poor countries in the world, policy is really much better than it used to be. And I think we could take some credit for that. So one of the things that if you talk to non-economists, they often think, well, oh, economics is about forecasting. Where are interest rates going to be six months from now? And on that basis, economics is a disaster because it can't forecast at all in that area. <laughs> How do you go about persuading non-economists that economics it can actually contribute something really valuable? Well, uh, you know, I think it was Charlie Schultz who said once that economists are much better at getting rid of bad ideas than they are at coming up with good ones. And I think that's often true. I mean, you can show that something is internally inconsistent and you have some chance of persuading people that they're thinking about it wrong. And that does seem to me sort of valuable. But, you know, when you see what's going on in D.C. now and, you know, mercantilist protectionism with one-on-one -on -one trade deficits is carrying the day, you know, do we bear some responsibility for not having killed that all? I don't know. Should the American Economic Association say that if you say things like that, you should be drummed out of the association? No, because I think if you get a professional association writing a manifesto, it just triggers, oh, God, it's these experts again. Yeah. And they're always claiming to know more than in fact they do. Um, it's, a, it's a much more general thing of, of helping people understand how to think about an argument, how to frame an argument, not to bamboozle people with what I call bogus quantification. But if you look at, say, the stuff that um, Raj Chetty's been doing recently, yes. which is, is basically, you know, that seems a real step forward. And, you know, the administrative data is enormous. Um, you can see patterns that we didn't know were there. It's sort of like having the national accounts in 20 dimensions right. or something. But, you know, even there, I've noticed that people say things like, you know, they will study a period in the past, 
which is all you can do on this record. And they'll say black kids are much less likely to rise to the top than white kids. Right? But they don't use the word was or were. Yeah. They use the word is. is. And you know what was true in the last 25 years has become an eternal verity. And we know that some of the patterns in there, like marriage patterns, incarceration patterns, a lot of stuff that's happened, you know, these marriage patterns of less educated whites that I was talking about, those change dramatically. And those help control those things. Which is why I like to, th I mean, I, I remember always pushing back on this idea that the main role of an economist is to explain why ideas of politicians are bad ones. If that's all you're going to do, it doesn't sound very exciting. Well, you but, must have uh, tried. Right. Well, but I think what we tried to do was to come up with something positive. Uh, yeah, this is okay. the way to think about, about it. And that's what your work has been about. I mean, your work on deaths of despair hasn't been telling people that their proposed policies are wrong. It's been saying, this is something you didn't know was happening. And look at the numbers. That's true. So it's clear that people do radically change their mind about things faced with data that they did not expect. Uh -huh. Right, and I think of that as a causal statement. It wouldn't pass the causality police in economics, <laughs> but you know, if yeah. if people think there's a certain mechanism going on, and you show them some data which shows that mechanism is not at work, yeah. that is a very strong causal statement. You know, even if there's no, whatever. Um, so I agree with that. But then they say the question that you were going to ask, you asked me before. I mean, what do you tell politicians to do? Well, it may be a mistake to say that there is one simple answer or even a complicated answer, but to say this is how you ought to think about the problem. And that may change the way they think about the problem and lead them themselves to come up with, with different ideas. Well, that's true. Or you can be much more militant than I think you or I would be. You know, if you look at what Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Sayas and um, Zuckman, who are advising Elizabeth Warren and coming up with very precise plans, which are plans, and they would take you all the way back to the utility functions and behavior underneath it and be very certain of the result. I mean, I envy them their certainty. I don't think you really envy them. <laughs> so, see, somehow I, and it, it, so you've done pioneering work in theory consumer demand theory in econometrics, econometric techniques, and applications to real data. And I sense that over half a century that you've just had this enormous attachment and intellectual base in terms of the numbers yeah. and measurement issues. Where did that come from? And why do you think it's so important? I don't know. I think it was there very early on. Um, I, you know, I could talk about Richard Stone, who was yeah. our mentor, both of our mentors, and he was certainly really into measurement and certainly encouraged that in everybody around him. But I, I suspect, you know, it was there before. Yeah. You know, my father escaped from the coal mines by learning how to use a theodolite, you know, and he was into measurement, measurement and yeah. he wanted to survey and, you know, calculate things. Uh, so I think that was probably in me very, I mean, I'll tell you one story that um, I have my PhD thesis on my shelf. I don't know if you still have yours. I never completed one of them. Oh, I, that's I right. published the book, you see, instead. Yeah. And that was, in those days, you didn't have to, have to bother with a degree. Actually, you did, if you were me, not if you were you, <laughs> right? <laughs> this was, we were on the hinged generation where the really, really smart kids got college fellowships and didn't have to get a PhD. Yeah, that's right. Whereas if you weren't a really smart kid like me, you know, if you'd failed your math exams over and over again, then you had to go and get a PhD as a sort of penance as a way of getting out of this. So I did a PhD. Anyway, so I have a PhD thesis on my shelf. And occasionally I take it down, and I'm very careful with it, because if you're not careful, the Greek letters all fall out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because get to stick them when in. I, <laughs> you're laughing, because you lived in this time, too. You, you know, the typewriters didn't have anything on it. And there were no word processors. Yep. So you, the assistant who was typing it for you had to use a stencil which had Greek letters on it, yep. and they went, in, and after time they dry out and fall off. So if you were to take my thesis and really shake it, there would be a rain <laughs> crowd of Greek letters, uh, which is something you guys will never see. Anyway, but I occasionally read a few pages, 
And I think I've learned a lot in the last 50 years. But I read this and I think, you haven't learned very much. You knew all this stuff already. Interesting. Um, and it's not that I'm selling this as a great thesis. I don't think it's such a great thesis. But it was like I knew how to do my work. Yeah. Yeah. Then. Do you feel that way too? I think so. Yeah. Um, it, it, partly, it's partly the illusion of age that although 50 years has gone by, I still feel I'm the same person. Yeah. Um, There's that. Yeah. Um, but in addition to having a word processor where the Greek letters didn't fall out, what was it that made you decide to come and live in America? Well, um, that's a good question. I'd visited Princeton for a year in 1979 when I was at Bristol, and I certainly could not believe the resources that were available at Princeton. And of course, Princeton's not typical. Um, but it wouldn't be that different from <coughs> other top places. Um, and also, when I went back to Bristol, it was at a time when Mrs. Thatcher was cutting back on the universities. And the universities at that point had absolutely no way to deal with it. Oh. I mean, you know, Bristol, where I was, had a budget that was more or less balanced every year and had no endowment. So when it lost 15 or 20 percent of its budget, which it did, it had to fire tenured faculty. And we were spending every Monday afternoon sitting around in yeah. meetings deciding yeah. who to fire, um, which was a very unpleasant thing. That I, and it just made it sort of impossible to work. So when you know, I'd, I'd had various letters that would come and say, come to America, and I never really paid any attention to them. But then, then I got one. You got one, and you said, <laughs> thought, well, maybe, yes. we, maybe we should think about this. Yeah. And, um, Years later, when you won the Nobel Prize. Did you have any idea that you might win it? Do they tell you you're on a short list? <laughs> How does it work? They don't tell you nothing. Um, you don't it just know comes anything. out of the blue. Uh, well, that's, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. I mean, you know, the profession speculates endlessly about who's going to get the Nobel Prize. And the Thompson's organization or whatever it is comes out with a list of predictions every year based on citations. And people read those and talk about them. But you know, the Nobel thing, first of all, you do not get any advance notice of any sort at all. And they're very, very careful, uh, or they try to be. Um, and I'm pretty sure they are. Yeah. Um, so I don't think, you know, when it's announced next week that anyone knows, the, the person knows who that's going to be. But just to make the point, I think, you know, obviously, I'd known for some years that it was a possibility. But if I'd been asked to write down all the names of other possibility, there would have been 100 people on that list. And also, they have a habit of giving it to people you've never heard of or you thought were dead. <laughs> you know? And who said, so, I mean, you know, when Havelmo got the Nobel Prize, I had no idea that Havelmo was still alive. alive yeah. right? And for yeah, those of us who. <laughs> it's like the House know, of Lords. The, well, there's yeah, okay. I, I remember, you know, in, when we were young in Cambridge, we thought that Keynes had killed Hayek in single combat. Sort of, and, and he couldn't possibly still be alive. Right? There he was. But there he was, you know. So, um, so I, I knew it was a possibility, but it's just like, you know, it, it always was a small probability. So, where were you when you heard? <laughs> I was lying in bed, thinking, <laughs> oh, God, another day. <laughs> you know? And I was sort of wandering around naked when the phone rang. So luckily, we don't have video phones in the house. <laughs> <laughs> and you believe them when they, the, they, how did they convince you it was really them? Well, it was only when Torsten, Torsten Person, no. who is, is now the secretary of the committee, yep. but was then just a member of it, I think, um, when he said to me, um, Angus, this is not a hoax. <laughs> and I thought, that was the first I thought, <laughs> I thought that you introduced that worm into my head. <laughs> you know, that this might actually be hoax. It not really occurred to me until that moment. So, um, Has it changed your life? Yes. Um, I mean, it certainly changes your life. There, there's no question about that. And actually, for me and for Anne and I, the paper about the Dust of Despair appeared 10 days after the Nobel Prize came out. And when you get the Nobel Prize, you have some inkling that weird things are going to happen and that you're, you're going to be swamped by the press. 
um, as I was, but it was nothing compared with the reaction to that paper. So it was like having two tsunamis right. sort of immediately totally after one another. So it was a very weird, um, very weird experience. How did you decide, or when did you decide, and why, to become an economist? Because I kept failing math exams, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it's a, it's not a it's sort of a funny yeah. story because you know I'd been at Cambridge for two years, and I would lost interest in mathematics long before I got to Cambridge, and it was also incredibly badly taught at that time. I remember actually comparing much more recently notes with Oliver Hart at Harvard. Mm -hmm. who I think was one year behind me in the math course. He was my roommate. He was your roommate. So maybe two my, years. He was my roommate, and he was doing maths, and I was doing economics. And I persuaded Oliver that we should both go to Warwick to do a master's in economics. Okay. Then I got the job offer from Richard Stone, and I right. stayed in Cambridge. He went to Warwick and then to Princeton. Oh, is that right? Mm. He, wasn't he at Essex? For, anyway, no, whatever. No, he he no, went to okay. Warwick for one year and then to Princeton. Right, Okay. Oh, because he went to Warwick and then he was a graduate student at Princeton. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Then he came yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Oliver had persuaded me it wasn't all me. You know, the, there were these decrepit old professors in green gowns with holes in them, you know, who were reading the same yellowing lecture notes that they'd read for 40 years, <laughs> you know, and it was truly terrible stuff. Um, but I, I'd lost interest before that anyway. So at the end of my second year, I went to my tutor in Fitzwilliam College and um, said, well, what am I going to do now? And I, he said, well, you, you could leave. And I said, well, that's what I'd like to do. But, you know, my father would have been really, really upset uh -huh. um, given where I'd come from and, um, and where he'd come from. So I felt like I couldn't really do that. To him. And I said, well, what's the alternative? He said, there's only one thing for people like you. And I said, what's that? He said, it's called economics. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've talked a lot about um, the influence of background and what it was like to be a student in the 50 years ago. And in a, in a way, we both grew up in a society that was gradually becoming a meritocracy. We thought this was a great idea. Meritocracy clearly better than an aristocracy. And we thought this is a wonderful idea. But somehow, where we are today, the, the meritocrats claim to know more than they really do. Were we really right in thinking that a meritocracy was so much better than what went before? I don't know. It certainly opened up opportunities for people like you and me. Who, who would not have had them. I mean, I would never have gone to Cambridge. And I doubt you would yeah. either. Um, it's also true that some jobs are better done by people who are more capable of doing those jobs than <laughs> otherwise. So, you know, maybe one of the reasons central banking has gotten better is because, you know, technocrats like you, who were well-educated, could do it instead of, you know, people who dropped off a family tree somewhere. I, I mean, I'll let you comment on that. <laughs> well, I think that's, that, that's true. There's obviously you want jobs to be done by people who are better equipped at doing it. But somehow what we've seen in the last few years is almost the rise of those merit meritocrats. Instead of saying we are, we are fortunate to have these jobs because we are better at doing it, we are superior to other people yeah. because we are more talented. And that switch, that flip, to a sense of superiority is extremely dangerous. I think so. And it's very bad for the people who are left behind because yeah. the people who succeed in the meritocrat meritocracy can despise the people beneath them yeah. or disrespect them and say, well, you had your chance too and you didn't make it. Yeah. It's not, and then they get very smug about their yeah. own self-satisfaction. Yeah. They minimize the role of luck. Um, but the other thing, you know, that Michael Young, who invented the term in 1958, predicted, and I think it's been very deleterious, is that if you take all the smart kids out of those communities and promote them to the upper classes, those communities have no one left to really represent them. Uh -huh. All right? So if you think of um, Clement Attlee's cabinet in 1945, there were seven members of that cabinet who'd started life at the coalface, oh. right? That are now <coughs> no, well, there's 
hardly any even labor members of parliament yeah. in Britain who've done a day's work with their hands yes. and their lives. So there are still lots of people who work with their hands, but they're not represented anymore. So, and I think it's communities that are coming apart too. So you've got these communities that used to have a wide range of talented people. And all those talented people have been sucked up and gone upstairs sort of idea. And that does bad things to the social capital, to the education mm -hmm. and everything in those communities. So I think there's a lot of things to worry about. The one mistake I think we made is we thought it was just. Right? Mm -hmm. And justice based on birth, I don't think is any worse than justice based on the ability to pass exams. I mean, I think a lot of people find that idea hard. Yes. We, it's a foundational value in America mm -hmm. that everybody has equal opportunity. But you don't have equal opportunity. You only have opportunities if you can pass exams. And what's so great about that? Yeah. That's a challenging answer. I think this is now time to open the questioning up to our audience, uh, who are obviously good at passing exams. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult Are you all that. just? <laughs> now, who would like to ask Angus a question? There's one over here. There's a micro we have microphones that will be passed around. So right behind please you. wait. And could you possibly give your name and explain you know, who you are? Sure. You Thank you so much question. for coming. My name is Akshay. I'm an alumni of the school. Graduated about five years ago. Um, just shifting towards development and uh, the emerging markets. Um, you know, if, if you look at uh, high populated or high, rapidly growing countries like uh, you know, Bangladesh, Indonesia, India, uh, that have traditionally been agrarian, and that are now trying to move to a, a more digital age. Um, is there any, with, with such a high population, is there any chance for these countries to, uh, to, to come out of an agrarian society, or will you always have to be agrarian with 1.2 billion people? Well, I billion think people? they can come out of it. I mean, you know, China was an agrarian society. According to my calculations, which have been very heavily disputed, the poverty rate in China is now lower than the poverty rate in the United States. Um, and we've been very bad at leaving some people behind. So there's a real irreducible, very bad poverty in some places in the US. But in China, I don't think it's there anymore. And you know, India still has, what, 20% poverty by World Bank numbers, but it's come down very rapidly. Um, so, I mean, I, I worry less about the you know, uh, the, the, the ability to make that transformation that I worry about autocracy in those countries. And that's economic growth in China that's done that. Yes. So when young Greta complains that we're destroying her future by pursuing economic growth, that's only part of the picture. <coughs> you mean, in the, well, and in, in the, I mean, the, the people who are anti-Greta yes. are the people who say, that you know, global warming is a small price to pay for the elimination of poverty in the world. I don't buy that argument, but no. that's what they would say. Okay. Good. Other quick one over there. Um, hi, I'm Mark Gertler. Um, hi, Mark. I was wondering if you and Anne thought about the sort of the trends that you document in, in your book as being part of a broader phenomenon, part of a perfect storm. And what I have in mind is the great financial crisis. That is, yeah. you have these trends going on, and then the financial crisis hits. It creates hardship. It creates um, disruption. It gives rise to the Tea Party general dysfunction. And if we sort of hadn't gone that course, maybe things might have been a bit more manageable. And also just the general demise of expertise you know, after the Great Recession. Right. I agree with that. I mean, and in fact, in the book, we write, in writing the book, I think we've both come to understand that we probably professionally have understated the bad consequences of the Great Recession. You know, because I think for many ordinary people, you know, they were sold those high salaries for bankers, the high salaries for the meritocrats, on the grounds that it was in the public interest. And not everybody bought that, but it was a sort of plausible enough story. And lots of economists, including economists on the left, bought that story. You know, and it was okay, and deregulation was okay, and taking away regulations on banks was okay. 
And then when people lost their houses and they lost their jobs and the bankers went unpunished, I think it just, you know, it exposed the whole thing as being yeah, a scam. Yeah, Anne. Yeah. So as far back this week in the trade presentation of the death records in the early 90s, things were going off the rails for people without college degrees. So we think that like the, the stagnation of majors went all the way back to 1970. By the time it gets to 1990, people's lives are starting to come apart. So um, certainly it was getting more fuel to that fire. Yeah. And also make it very hard to It's, I mean, the world really did, in some sense, change after 1970 in pretty fundamental way. Um, Bob Putnam has a new book coming out in which he has this, everything is this big U-shape with good things, you know, um, everything getting better up until about 1970 and then things coming apart after that. He even has done one of these Google Gram counts of the words I and we, right? Mm -hmm. And the word we, which, the use of the word we, which went steadily up until 1970, was replaced by the use of the word I after sure, 1970. Right. I mean, this sort of upsurge in selfishness. A question, yes. Just coming with a microphone here. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, so there are several prominent economists, including fellow Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, who've documented that when we talk about things like happiness and living standards and life satisfaction, there's a huge gulf between several European countries and Scandinavian countries and the United States. And that gap has only widened since the early 1990s. Um, do you think a possible explanation for that widening is the rise of te technocracy in economics? Well, we certainly haven't done very much to stop it. I hadn't really heard that. I mean, and Marcia doesn't like these happiness measures, by and large. So I, I wasn't familiar that he was arguing that. But it's certainly true that if you compare not just with Scandinavia, but with other European countries, and you sort of plot the average level of self-reported happiness against GDP or the logarithm of GDP, the US is way low on its life evaluation. Um, if you ask people how happy they were, that they have a lot of happiness yesterday, the U.S. is way up there because it's in the Declaration of Independence. We have to do that. You know, we have to pursue happiness. Um, but people don't think of themselves as very satisfied with their life. And I don't, there's too many explanations for me to pin one. But it's clear that you know what's happening to these less educated Americans is really bad. So one thought that's prompted by what you said earlier is that it is very striking that economics treats everyone as an individual. We have our own utility function. We're either happy or not. Whereas I think most people think of happiness or other aspects of life in terms of groups of people, particularly the family, that you experience happiness with other people, not on your own. And that is missing from a lot of the, of the yeah. discussion. It's very strong in the happiness literature. You know, because if you talk to people, um, especially if you ask the happy question as opposed to the life evaluation mm -hmm. question, you say, did you experience a lot of happiness yesterday? And then you debrief them and say, well, why? What were you doing? We were with friends. Yes. You know, we right. were watching a soccer match with friends. Yeah. Right. And Spain won the World Cup or something. You know, that yeah. sort of thing. Right. Um, and they get ecstatic um, during these sort of, but it's with friends. And yes. actually, I think one of the things, when Danny Kahneman and I looked at some of these emotions, if you get below about $70,000 a year in the U.S., you, the happiness really begins to suffer. And I think it's because you don't have money to do to things go with out, others. Yeah. yeah. To Possibly. go out with your pals to go to a soccer match, you know, to, right. to have a meal in Applebee's or something, you know. Right. Just, right. Now, other, any other, yes. Hi, Lawrence Kaufman, a uh, Stern alum. You, earlier you had mentioned the Medicare for All as a sort of big picture, how do we put money back in people's wallets. Right. 
we, when you mentioned that real wages have been stagnant, not even stagnant, they're falling, um, is there an, a big picture that would maybe result in real wage growth? Sorry, I'm not, a big picture that would do what? That, that might, in, where the, the Medicare for all would say, put money in people's pockets. Yeah. But a big part of, on, on the happiness scale, as we were just talking about people who fall below $70,000 in, yeah. in earnings, any thoughts to how to generate wage increases or wealth increases? Well, I think, yes, because I think that, um, you know, if you're a corporation, I mean, one of the things that's happened within corporations is they don't employ their own janitors anymore. They don't employ their own transport. They don't employ their own restaurant staff. They do it from outside firms. Those outside firms pay a lot less. Um, you don't belong anymore. You have very little chance of being promoted in the company because you're working for the Maverick cleaning company and not for General Motors or something. And so if they didn't have to pay, the, the, the numbers came out just the other day. Now the average employer cost for a family health plan is $20,000, over $20,000 a year. If you've got an employee who's worth maybe $30,000 to the company, it's crazy. You just have them out. Now many people on the right would argue that a lot of those supply companies are using um, you know, undocumented immigrants. Um, we get told that all the time, but I don't think there's much evidence for that. But they're certainly not paying benefits, and they're not. So you can basically shed the benefits. And, you know, I think it's, that's one of the reasons why you're not getting these deaths of despair in Europe, because they have, you know, national health systems, and employees don't, employers and employees don't have to bear those costs. So I think it's a, just a huge number. I mean, if you think having to pay $20,000 for someone who's worth about $30,000 to the company, it's, it's a no-brainer to get rid of them. Question? Uh, Stephen Graham, uh, adjunct faculty. That 70000 number, is that household income, or is that per capita? And the, well, it's household income as reported by individuals. It's a pretty noisy number, but that's where it came out, you know, the curve stops yeah. going up. And I would say, too, that for something like, just to come back to this, I don't think you can get the numbers, but there are very few of the people who work in Amazon warehouses who actually work for Amazon. Um, they're nearly all working for um, supply company. Hi, I'm an undergrad undergrad student here, um, and my question was, so you talked a lot about how there's a correlation between um, education levels and mortality here in America, so what concrete changes do you think uh, should be made in order to alleviate this problem? Um, you know, I've now written, or half written, I wrote a book before called The Great Escape, and then Anne and I wrote this book, and I finished both of them thinking, I should know a lot more about education <laughs> than I do. Um, but one of the things that's true about our educational system is the educational system here, and I think in Britain too today, is entirely driven by getting people to go to college. But two thirds of them don't get there. And so that money is just like wasted. And it's a terrible injustice to you know, lavish all this public money on these schools. So we've got to do something about that. I don't know whether the German system would work better, or, but we've got to have more ways for people to go. And, you know, it's the same thing we were talking about, the meritocracy. Yeah. I mean, other people have proposed that, for instance, top schools should lose their tax breaks unless they do much better than they're doing at opening up the gateway to much more, many more students and a much broader swathe of students, for instance, and not just select them on exam results. Any more questions? Uh, yes, there's one here and one over there. <clears throat> so my name is uh, David Gottfried. I'm a pediatric surgeon and going back to get my executive MBA, hopefully and be involved in healthcare changes. So one of the questions I have is, you've pointed out or we've discussed how many companies are shedding 
low, low income workers. Do you see, as time goes on, a possibility for that to expand into higher wage or workers that have attended four years of college? Well, I think the, you know, the robots and things are sort of coming for us all. <laughs> so, probably even surgeons, right? Um, yeah, their hands don't shake. Is that right? So that sort of thing. Um, but I think the the these costs of healthcare that employers and not to, not just that, but you know the the ERISA stuff and the safety stuff and all the rest of it, and the four hundred one k hit much more less well paid workers because basically the cost of healthcare is not that different if you're a low paid worker than if you're a high paid worker. And so paying $20,000 for healthcare for someone who earns $150,000 a year is not such a big deal. But for someone who you would like to pay $30,000, it's a huge deal. Um, and so I think that would take a lot of the pressure and, and it acts more at the bottom. But you know, if our healthcare costs go up to $50,000 a year, or whatever it is, then it's gonna move up the scale because um, you know, it's just, um, this huge cancer on the body economic or the tapeworm, as Warren Buffett likes to call it. The what? The cancer is better Then the tapeworm? But the tapeworm is sort of, you swallow it and it's just tiny, or you swallow it as an egg, right? Then it's sort of. No? Cancer does that too, yeah. I guess. Yeah, okay. We'll use the cancer thing then. We're still <laughs> revising the uh, copy edited. Let's have a question that doesn't involve quite so much medical knowledge. <laughs> There's someone over there. Yes. Fine. Moritz Schillerich. Um, uh, Mark mentioned the uh, perfect political storm or economic and political storm, the, the crisis. So having both of you up there, I can't resist asking what do you think about Brexit and the implications of that? That's, Today, a, that's one for you. Yeah. So, between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. tonight is an opportunity for me never to think about Brexit. In that way. <laughs> and I have absolutely no intention of changing that conviction. So we're here to listen to Angus, and none of us are going to mention the word Brexit until after 7 p.m. So I, I one more. Have... Sorry? <laughs> One more question. I was just going to say that I think the stresses in Britain have been handled a little better than the stresses here. Would you agree with that? Well, in, in terms of health care and some of these longer run issues, that is true. But what has become apparent uh, during the discussions after the, the referendum we had in 2016, not to mention the magic word, is that the whole political process has sort of broken down because those people who feel they've risen to the top as part of the meritocracy, and as you pointed out earlier on, many of them have moved from different parts of the country to work in London. So London is top heavy with meritocrats and they feel superior. Yes. And they make that absolutely apparent to everyone else. Only the inferior people would have voted for this outcome. Yes. And people feel utterly frustrated by it. They played by the rules of the democratic game and they've just been ignored. And no one seems to worry about the fact that they're ignoring this. It is, that kind of attitude becomes, I think, difficult. And it's linked to something that you talked about outsourcing. I think outsourcing is a major issue here, not just because of the effect on wages, but because of the effect of people not belonging. I, during the crisis at the Bank of England, we only had about 1,800 people working in the bank. So I talked to the whole of the staff. And the organization was under some criticism and attack from outside. And it was absolutely vital to be able to say to people, you know, when you go to the pub on a Friday night and people say, where do you work? And you say, Bank of England. Or what do you do there? I said, we all give the same answer. I always, say, I always started with we. We all give the same answer. Our job is to try to ensure sufficient stability in the banking system and in the economy as a whole. And my part in it is, right. and it might be cleaning the floors, it might be making the computers work, making the microphones work for the meetings. Uh, and, the, and you could tell that the fact that they all felt they belonged 
and their job was a vital cog in it, was crucial to their sense of not only belonging, but actually performing well. Right. Uh, and once you outsource all that, it all goes. It's gone. It's all I gone. think that's a terrible cause of despair. Yeah. There's a very nice quote. There's a book by someone called Bloodworth, a journalist in Britain, who's written, who did one of these undercover mm -hmm. and worked in an Amazon warehouse. And those Amazon warehouses, or as they're called, fulfillment centers. Yes. The, the fulfillment is the customer, not the people who work right. there. Right, right. And they're <coughs> situated in old mining areas in Britain, like in Yorkshire, where there are a lot of motorways, so they can take this stuff out. And someone who worked there said, when you ask someone now, they say, I'm with Amazon. In the old days, no one would ever say, I'm with the coal board. They say, I am a collier, and I am proud of being a collier. Yeah. And no one dies in an Amazon warehouse, and people died in the mines all the time. My grandfather was killed by a runaway truck in a Yorkshire coal mine. Um, and it's much safer, and it's much cleaner, and it's probably better paid. But this thing of belonging okay, yeah. is, and coal mining, no one should ever have been a coal miner in the history of the world. Yeah. But there was yeah. a society around that, and you know, you've seen these movies with brass bands and yep. this, all that sort of stuff. And some of that society was pretty awful. There was a lot of violence against women, there was a lot of drinking. Um, and you know, it's no accident that the Methodists started in those areas and so on. But. You know, there was a real society there, and we're losing it, and we seem to have lost a lot of it for people who are not very well educated. And that's, we think, the roots of despair. Yeah. So this, I agree with you 100%. This outsourcing is really central, and we've largely inflicted it on ourselves. Yeah. I think this is a wonderful moment to, as we have to, since time has run out, draw this to a close. NYU is a community where we all belong. And I hope you'll feel that tonight has been an opportunity for everyone to listen to a truly remarkable economist who has helped to change the world. So let's give a very big, stern oh, thank, thank you, you so much. to Angus Steve.